All right, welcome back to What Can Pyroclast Tell Us? Mechanisms of Generation, Transport, and Sedimentation and Explosive Eruptions, number three. I want to remind everyone that there are, after this wonderful session, there will be two more sessions about pyroclasts running all afternoon. Our first speaker this afternoon is Amanda Clark, and she'll be speaking on modeling the dynamics and deposits characteristic of dilute pyroclastic density currents, and this is an invited talk. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for coming, and thanks for uh, inviting me to this session. <laughs> okay, so I'd like to focus today on the, um, some of the phenomena that you see here in these images that come from Belisov and Belisova from the Kromskoye Lake eruption in 1996. The um, lava was emitted at the base of the uh, water lake, which caused an explosion, which led to these instabilities and in jetting at the front of that explosion, followed by gravitational collapse and the formation of these pyroclastic density currents uh, emitting radially from the flow, or from the center of the, of the vent. Then eventually, due to sedimentation, that density current became less dense than the ambient and lofted. Okay, here's a video that was provided to me by them, and I'll just go over these ideas again. So here you can start to see that sort of explosive phase and the jetting. We lose it for a few minutes here, a few seconds here. And then you can start to see the gravitational collapse that happens a few seconds after onset, and that gravitational collapse is feeding these radially spreading density currents. Those density currents are thickening as, as a result of entrainment, and they're also settling um, particles or pyroclasts during the, the process. And then eventually, it's less dense than the ambient and therefore lofts, and you can see some of these buoyant uh, plumes. Okay, so this talk, I'm going to focus on the pyroclastic density currents or the surges that spread radially from these kinds of events, as you can see here. And we'll try to calculate some things that are interesting for hazards, such as the runout distance and dynamic pressures. I also am, am motivated in part by a lot of observations made by my co-author, Brittany Brand, during her uh, thesis work, in which we are trying to relate the deposit characteristics to the dynamics of emplacement. And in particular, I'll focus uh, this talk a little bit on these kinds of dune structures that are formed in, in these kinds of density currents, and as such uh, is observed here at Sinker Butte, which is a three-meter uh, wavelength. Okay, so the, the tools that, that we're going to use in this talk are related to um, a model presented by Bursick and Woods in 1996 and some ideas originally presented in Valentine 1987 that describes the density stratification in these kinds of flows. And what I'll focus on is more or less the role of particle size in controlling some of the large-scale dynamics and, part, uh, and the, the deposit characteristics in these flows. And then I will make some, some comparisons to the Mars environment later in this talk if I get there. So just some of the assumptions. I just want to draw your attention to the vertically average properties, which I'll try to address a little bit later in this talk. And the model itself is steady, which is also an assumption. So we have the mass flux on the left-hand side of the equation, where we have it as a function of the density of the flow, the velocity, the height, and the radius. And then on the right-hand side, we have mass added due to entrainment, and this entrainment coefficient is a function of Richardson number, so it changes throughout the flow. And then mass loss to sedimentation, which is parameterized according to the settling velocity of the particles. Then we have the, the momentum equation, where we have momentum flux on the left. And then on the right, we have representation of forces that can add or subtract momentum from the, the flow, such as uh, gravitational acceleration down a slope, um, acceleration due to current density decrease in the direction of the flow, um, importantly, the frictional drag at the base of the flow, and momentum loss due to sedimentation. And then the energy flux is a function of those same parameters, as well as the temperature and the pressure in the flow. And we have, on the right-hand side, cooling via entrainment and loss of thermal energy due to sedimentation. So what I'm going to present here are some examples to kind of get a sense of, of how particle size affects the overall characteristics of these, of these flows. So these input conditions are constrained by some detailed 
um, data published about the tall 1965 eruption as well as the Karimsky Lake eruption that you saw that's published in Belosov and Belosova. And so in these plots, I have a number of, of characteristics of the flows plotted against the radial distance, and we can see how they're changing uh, with radial distance. So the runout distance increases with it decreasing particle size due to that slower sedimentation. And so having gone through a lot of um, runs of this model, I found that the particle size was the biggest factor in controlling the runout distance in these flows. And so for these fine grain flows, you get a runout distance of three kilometers versus these coarser grain flows, which have runout distances in this case of less than a kilometer. The, den or the velocity decreases with distance, as one might expect for radial spreading. And the one thing I want to point out here is that we have non-zero velocities at liftoff. So this just highlights the idea that these flows do not come to rest or cease propagating by their velocities progressing down to zero, but rather they stop propagating because they become less dense due to sedimentation and entrainment than the ambient, and therefore loft. And those velocities at the time of lofting can be non-zero. The dynamic pressure is similar for all cases, except it's a bit higher for these fine-grained um, flows because of the um, density is maintained for a longer period. And I, I just want to point out here, due to that depth averaging in those equations, this represents an average power, uh, density um, or uh, dynamic pressure, which is not going to represent um, maybe uh, characteristics near the base of the flow where we get rapid sedimentation and high densities near the base where we could have very high dynamic pressures. Now, this last figure is of accumulation rate uh, versus radial distance. And I'm using this as a proxy for the dep depositional environment or for the overall deposit distribution. And so if you use this as a, a way to predict deposit distribution, you can say something about the anticipated bed or uh, landforms that will form. So for these larger or coarser flows, you will get these sort of uh, narrower or um, very steep-sided and thicker deposits versus these very fine-grained flows where you expect these kind of more pancakey um, low aspect ratio flows or high aspect ratio flows or uh, de deposits. And then here's just a little bit of um, benchmarking that I've done, and this is the velocity versus radial distance for the Sedan nuclear weapons test. And the, the data match reasonably well for those density currents. But the point is, is I've made some comparisons to other data uh, in, the, in the literature for volcanological settings, but there isn't a lot of data. So I'll leave it at that and, and, and say that there, it's pretty hard to benchmark some of these, some of these models. And then here I just want to sort of go back to those two um, reference cases of Tall and, and Karimsky Lake and say something about the deposit characteristics or the deposit distribution. So I have that proxy for deposit thickness here, and I'm going to show against that the data from uh, the Karimsky Lake eruption, which shows that it has this kind of um, sort of thick and, and rapidly decreasing thickness with distance from source versus the Tall eruption, where we have this much more diffuse or subtle um, uh, distribution of the deposit. And, I, and I'll only say here that this is consistent, reasonably consistent with the grain size data that's published for these two events in which the Karimsky Lake deposit is coarser grained than the, the Taal event. And so that's consistent with this general idea. So now I just want to talk a little bit about um, the possibility to add some complexity to this model. So we've got... Um, what here is the, the Rouse number, and the Rouse number is the ratio of the settling velocity of the particles, whoops, a settling velocity of the particles to the suspending velocity or the shear velocity. So for high Rouse numbers we have for, for large particles, we anticipate having this really severe density stratification in these flows with very high densities near the base. For low Rouse numbers, i.e. small particles, we expect to have something that's much more vertically uniform. Okay, and so we can kind of think about the flows in this way and proceed and start to say something about the corresponding um, characteristic uh, gravity wave frequencies. And so there's an idea in the literature, and this is not yet proven, so I'll, I'll just sort of leave it out there as an idea, that the anti-dune bed forms, such as you saw in the earlier images, are controlled by the gravity wavelengths 
of the, of the um, characteristic gravity waves in those uh, supercritical flows. And so the characteristic frequency of those waves is a function of the Rouse number, which you see here, and inversely proportional to the thickness of the flow. So then we can sort of take that characteristic frequency and, and manipulate it according to uh, an equation such as this, where you can, can derive the wavelength of those waves by taking the propagation velocity of the flow, dividing it by that characteristic frequency, and maybe starting to say something um, to some extent about these kinds of bed forms that you should expect in these deposits. Okay, so what I've done is I've incorporated those concepts in a simple way into that, into that model, and I'm just now saying something in general about the expected bed forms according to uh, grain size. So for example, if you go from coarse grains of one centimeter to down to 0.1 millimeter, you expect an increase in the bed form wavelength by about a factor of two or three. If you increase, however, the velocity at the initial phase of these eruptions, you expect an increase uh, with velocity of those characteristic bed forms um, by about a factor of five. So in this case, the velocity seems to be sort of a critical control on these characteristics, and therefore, these bed forms might be able to tell us something about the dynamic and placement conditions. And then I just made some comparison to the tall data, and, and all I want to say here is that the model reasonably predicts this kind of very limited data set, and it does a reasonably good job for other field data sets, most of which came from Brittany Brand's uh, PhD work, but there isn't a lot of this data out there, and so it's something that's, that's still in progress. Okay, so now I want to um, take some time to kind of change planets altogether and think about these, and in some ways a lot of this work was motivated by observations by rovers and, and imaging instruments on the planet of Mars, where they have seen evidence for this kind of eruption on the planet and these kinds of pyroclastic density currents. And, and that's not a surprise given that there's abundant basalt and evidence of subsurface ice on the planet. And the other thing is that not a lot of people have looked into the dynamics of these kinds of flows uh, on Mars. And, and remember, these are, I didn't mention this before, but these are the dilute regime rather than the concentrated regime. And so there's virtually nothing about these kinds of flows on, on Mars. Okay, so here I just make a direct comparison for the Earth and Mars case. So I use the same initial conditions that are based on those tall and, and Kerimsky data or those Kerimsky um, tall cases. And we have um, one third of Earth's gravity and um, about a factor of 100 less in the, uh, of the atmospheric density. And what you find under those conditions is that you get a doubling of the runout distance on Mars of these kinds of currents. If you decrease the, de uh, the the pyroclastic um, size, which is expected on Mars due to the greater fragmentation efficiency, you end up with a quadrupling of the runout distance. And it's, in essence, these kinds of bodies will be a lot harder to spot and much more subtle in character on Mars than they are for equivalent cases on Earth. And then, it, just to say something about bed forms, the predicted bed forms on, on Mars are up to a factor of two or three greater for the equivalent case um, on Earth. And so then I'll just finish there by, by saying basically that the, um, this model generally does a pretty good job of predicting the runout distance and the large scale characteristics of these flows, such as the deposit distribution, but it, it still needs a lot of work in terms of looking at maximum dynamic pressures near the base, as well as bed form characteristics. And I recommend sort of more field data as well as experiments, detailed experiments, looking at the sedimentation processes at the base of these flows. Um, and, and some more sort of statistical approaches to looking at uh, models or looking at the parametric studies of these models so that we can get a better understanding of how sensitive predictions are to individual terms. And then I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you. We have time for a question. Well, I have a question. I think on one of your final slides, you mentioned adding multiple grain sizes, <clears throat> multiple grain sizes to a single run. Mm -hmm. What's your prediction on 
how the, how, how that would add things together oh, yeah. or on run out. Yeah, that's something that I haven't gotten to because I haven't been working on this in a little while, but adding multiple grain sizes is obviously important. And my sense is that for any, any kind of deposit that might look like this, this sort of steep-sided deposit here, would be more diffuse with, with a broader grain size distribution. So I think any of these kinds of landforms would even be more uh, broadly distributed than they are in these model runs. Our next, our next speaker is John Major, and he'll be speaking on dynamics and deposits of multiple pyroclastic density currents associated with the May 2008 eruption of Chaiten Volcano. Thanks, Ben. Okay, thanks. Oops. Okay, for those of you who are not familiar with Chaiten Volcano, um, it's a small rhyolitic uh, volcano that's fairly remote in southern Chile, part of the southern volcanic zone. It's about a three kilometer wide caldera in which there is a, about a half a cubic kilometer sized obsidian rhyolite lava dome. And it's perched up on top of a pretty high relief ridge uh, with 600, 800 meters of relief surrounding the volcano. It's about 10 kilometers inland from the coast and it's surrounded by fairly steep, dissected, high-relief terrain that prior to the eruption was covered in fairly dense, temperate rainforest vegetation. And then just for a little bit of scale, the, the little t coastal town of Chai Ten here is at the, down at the mouth of the, the Chai Ten River, and it's about 10 kilometers from the volcano down to here. Now, in May of 2008, this volcano erupted explosively and, and fairly unexpectedly. And photo photographic documentation at the time showed that there was fairly significant erup uh, explosive activity very early in the eruption. And this uh, vigorous explosive activity lasted for about a week or so. And there was extensive downwind tephra fall. And a lot of the satellite imagery uh, showed that there was quite a bit of vegetation damage relatively near the volcano. In 2010, uh, a large interdis interdisciplinary international group of, of folks gathered down at Chai Ten with the goal of trying to understand in part kind of what happened up close to the volcano. And so this talk is going to look at some of the pyroclastic density currents and the evidence for them uh, in, in the basins right around the volcano. Now, some of the imagery that we looked at prior to going down there show that there were quite a few toppled trees near the volcano, um, a lot of a lot of proximal vegetation damage. Um, you can see that we've got some channels that are draining the, the, the caldera that are swept clean. And this all suggested that pyroclastic, pyroclastic density currents or some other volcanoclastic flows were triggered by the eruption. Um, once we got there, our field visit showed that there were some fairly small magnitude PDCs, and they were restricted uh, close to the volcano uh, to the north and to the northeast and east uh, they extend maybe about two kilometers from the caldera rim. To the south, there were a couple of block and ash flow style uh, PDCs related to a subsequent dome collapse. And they traveled about seven kilometers, almost got to the town of Chai Ten. Um, in this talk, I'm just going to restrict my, myself to what's going on here to the north and east, and we're not going to talk about what happened in the Chai Ten Valley at all. So this is a, an aerial view from a helicopter looking a bit northwest. Uh, so this is the, here's the lava dome, here's the caldera rim, north is out this direction. So to the north and, and also a bit to the northeast, there was a, a relatively small magnitude but a pretty energetic part, classic uh, PDC that, that swept this flank of the volcano. Uh, you can see that here's a, here's a little road that goes through here. So it gets out, you know, maybe about two kilometers to about the road and then it, it rather abruptly stops. But it, it left this pretty significant uh, damage gradient in the vegetation, such that up near the rim, you have essentially total tree removal. A little bit further down, you've got trees that are felled and, and standing dead. And then right around the very margins of it, where it begins to uh, uh, abruptly end, you've got some uh, kind of tree kill, leaf kill, you know, kind of singed tree sorts of things. So sort of like a little miniature Mount St. Helens, uh, very, very similar to what happened there. This is uh, just a map of some of the vegetation damage draped onto a DEM. 
And I just want to call your attention to the fact that to the north, you can see that these, these vectors are showing a tree orientation of the felled tree zone. And over here, the, the PDC really tends to follow the topography. It's, it's guided by topography quite a bit. Most of the orientations are downhill. You can see that there's some dynamic, uh, you know, crossing over. So there's, you know, convergence and divergence in the patterns. But generally, these are mostly downhill. Whereas over in, the, in this basin over here a little bit to the northeast, you actually see that the PDC was flowing parallel to the contour on the basis of these tree orientations before ultimately being guided down. So this is, we take this as evidence that these are, these are pretty mobile currents. Um, the other one I'll patch I'll call your attention to is this brown in here. And this is related to um, most of the trees are still standing, but they've essentially been delimbed. So it's sort of like you know, standing dead trunks. Now on the north side, this is just some of the impacts of the, the PDC on the, on the vegetation. So we've got a lot of standing delimbed, uh, a lot of toppled trees. And the force of the PDC was strong enough to be able to, to topple trees that you know, had a mean diameter of something about a meter. And it had sufficient particle concentration to abrade. Boy, this, uh, this guy is kind of dying here. There we go. It, it's sufficient to, to abrade the, the upslope sides of a lot of the trunks of these trees. Um, but when you look at the, the damage to the wood under the bark, it's, it's fairly uniform. The, bark, the, the wood is not really chewed up. And the impact marks, the, kind of the, the, the light abrasion on the wood is fairly uniform all the way up. So we take this to be evidence that you know, it's, it's strong enough to topple the trees. Oh, the other thing I should also mention is that many of the trees, instead of being broken off and snapped, were basically uprooted and toppled. And you can see here that the, the duration of the current was long enough that you actually started to get a little bit of piling up of the deposit on the, on the upslope sides of the root wads. So fairly dilute current in the sense that the, the abrasion of the wood is fairly uniform, and you don't have a lot of really extensive chewing of the wood uh, once the bark was remain, uh, removed. And little strings of epiphytes are still kind of clinging to some of these trees. The deposit on the north side, um, left uh, you know, several decimeters thick friable deposit, graded upward from a poorly sorted, very fines depleted uh, deposit, this pumiceous coarse ash and fine lapilli. And it grades upward into a rather fines enriched pumiceous and lithic coarse ash. Um, you've got some little bits of charred and un mostly uncharred wood in the base. And the, the characteristics of this deposit are very similar to those that have been described for directed lateral blasts at Mount St. Helens, Besamiani, and Montserrat. And then overlying this deposit, um, we've got some finer grain ash, which we interpret to be some, some later tephra falls. Up at the rim, uh, the characteristics of this deposit are very similar to what we see downslope. Uh, it tends to thin over topography. You can see that it tends to be piled up against the root wads. And again, some of the tephras that are up here that have been investigated by Alfano et al. suggest that this event occurred fairly early in the sequence of the explosive phase of the eruption. Oops, let's go back. So now we're going to take a look at kind of what happens a little bit more to the east. So in the caldera moat, there are some very large dune fields. Um, unfortunately, the photograph doesn't really depict that, but you can kind of see this curvilinear pattern. And those dune fields are composed of stratified pumiceous ash and lapilli that have curvy planar bedding to them and discontinuous bedding. And there's a low spot in the rim right here that we call Dub Crater Creek, and you find very similar deposits right at that kind of exit. If we go downstream a little bit down here at the confluence with this uh, channel, what we can find is that we have uh, a fairly thick pile of, of sediment. The, the deposit in here is about two meters thick or so. And here's, we've got a lot of the standing dead trees. They've been delimbed. And, you know, first blush, this looked like this was basically tephra fall and damage from tephra fall. But upon closer look, um, we've actually got some curvaplanar bedding within the deposits. And when we looked at the trees, we have ash clinging to the trees to a height of about 8 to 10 meters above the surface of the deposit, but not, ab not above that. So it's not the result of tephra raining down through the trees, um, but we've got 
you know, the, the evidence seems to suggest that there's more of a lateral passage of a current, as the, a lot of the ash tended to be plastered more on the upslope side. And then the understory vegetation tended to be knocked down in a downslope direction, and all the understory vegetation is kind of pointing downslope, which is not what you'd expect from just basic tephra fall. So if you go a little bit further down to the confluence, you've got pretty thick sediment fill here. Uh, most of that is the result of rainfall runoff and erosion of, of these deposits on the slope and then a very thick accumulation down here. But, but again, this, this curvy planar bedding, discontinuous bedding, um, ash clinging to, to a certain height above the trees and not beyond. So again, it looks like a dilute current that sort of swept through the area. So if we take some of the vegetation damage and characteristics of the vegetation damage and then some of the characteristics of the deposits and use some of the methods that Amanda and Barry Voigt have developed, we can make some at least kind of first order cuts at some of the dynamics of, of these dilute currents. And this is going to be focused mostly on the north side PDC. So if we assume that the trees were all delimbed before they were felled and we treat them as cylinders that are subject to a fluid drag, and we're going to assume that the flow was vertically uniform, you can relate the dynamic pressure to the breaking moment, uh, to the radius of the tree, the height of the flow, and some coefficient of drag. But rather than assume a, a breaking or a bending moment, we saw that most of the trees were basically uprooted and toppled, so we've managed to come up with sort of an uprooting moment. And when you do all that, you go through the calculation, and we're getting dynamic pressures, sort of ballpark two to four kilopascal. Uh, from deposit thicknesses, abrasion geometry, and some assumptions about gas densities, we estimate that the PDC to the north had a, a, a sediment concentration, kind of ballpark, you know, 10 to the minus three, and that leads us to an average bulk density on the order of about two to three kilograms per cubic meter. And for comparison, a debris flow is about 2,000 kilograms per cubic meter. So this is pretty dilute stuff, and it seems to be pretty much consistent with the physical evidence that we see uh, to the north side. And then if you relate, use this equation to relate dynamic pressure to velocity and average bulk density, we can invert this equation, and then by using our estimate of dynamic pressure and average bulk density, we end up estimating velocity kind of on the order of 30 to 40 meters per second. And if you think back to the plots Amanda showed, these numbers are all fairly consistent with kind of that first cut dilute model that she showed. So we think we're kind of in the ballpark, and these are just sort of, you know, order of magnitude sorts of numbers. So now the mechanism of formation. Um, the typical, mechanism, the typical mechanisms that have been invoked for directed lateral blasts are things like sector failure or large dome collapse, but we don't have that. So we instead hypothesize that we had a rapid decompression associated with vent opening that might have occurred along some subvertical fissures, and also that vent asymmetry can help guide the, the directionality of the PDC. And there's actually a very nice poster yesterday looking at vent asymmetry and how that can actually guide directionality. To the east, the PDCs were much less energetic, they were not strongly directed, and so we hypothesized that what went to the east was probably more your typical ver you know, vertical column collapse that sent you know, multiple small PDCs, dilute PDCs, sweeping out that direction. So to conclude, the explosive eruption of the Chaitan in May 2008 generated multiple small magnitude, moderate temperature, mobile PDCs. Uh, to the north, we have a, an event that's able to topple trees that are a, a meter in diameter out to two kilometers distance, but it doesn't really severely abrade them. The deposit has a blast-like signature, uh, but there's no kind of common mechanism, so we suggest that rapid decompression and you know, vent asymmetry control the directionality. The PDCs that go to the east are also dilute. They're a little bit less mobile than what goes out to the north and likely formed by column collapse and partial spillover uh, at the caldera rim. Thank you. Looks like we have time for a question. The sky couldn't quite hear. The circularity. Oh, the circularity. Um, it's a it's a mix. There's some pumice that's extremely vesicular, 
And then there's sort of the sub pumice that's a bit more dense. Uh, we, haven't, we haven't quantified it, but it, it's, it's kind of this mix. Um, the, the deposit to the north also has a fair, fair bit of lithic material in it as well. So it, it's, it's a little bit of a mix, but it is dominated by more of the pumiceous end. All right, our next talk is by Ellis and others, and this is Transport and Deposition of Pyroclasts from Hot, Dry Eruptions and the Sizes of High-Grade Ignimbrites. And this is an invited presentation. Okay. Great. Okay, well, um, thank you very much for the invitation, um, and thank you for making it to Friday. I know it's been a, a long week. Um, so this has been um, some things I've been thinking about for a number of years now from uh, the hot, dry ignum bright of uh, the central snake river plain. This is work that's been done in collaboration with John Wolf at Wazoo, Darren Mark, Paul Olin, and Mark Schmitz. <clears throat> and so if you saw, um, if you saw Heather, uh, Heather's talk this morning about welding, um, these rocks are also welded, but it's, it's almost a very different scenario. So this is like a welding turned up to 11. Okay, so um, some geological background. So um, we'll start with geology. Um, this is the track of the Snake River Plain, Yellowstone being up here, the Columbia River Basalt being down here, uh, broad time transgression of volcanism this way. Um, it's, a, it's a bimodal basaltic rhyolite province, um, and we're not going to talk too much about chemistry today, um, but it's important that there's a lot of basalts in here. As you can see, this nice smooth track in here. It's all covered by young basalts. And the importance of that is that we don't get to see um, the sources of, of these, these eruptions. So um, we're, we're kind of left fumbling a little bit in the dark in the outer reaches. So the rhyolites are exposed in the deep river canyons here and out on some of these ranges. This black square represents the type area of Snake River type volcanism defined by Brani et al. in 2008, which is a, a really unusual association of um, depositional lithophages, particularly in the rhyolites. Okay. So one thing I should mention to start with is that even though the depositional characteristics of a lot of these rhyolites are, are really kind of weird, um, the bulk compositions are, are, nothing, are nothing to write home about. So these are pretty typical rhyolites. We're not talking about super fluorine rich weird topaz things here. One thing that's going to be relevant to our story today is that um, the Snake River rhyolites come from magmas which are hot and dry. So these guys are 100 to 150 degrees hotter than your typical rhyolites from elsewhere. Okay, so I could, I could talk for uh, a while about the unusual volcanism in, in the Snake River, but the two points that are going to be of interest to us today are that um, there's a bimodality of welding, so you get these non-welded deposits here, which are essentially coarse-grade ash um, with these uh, black chips of dense volcanic glass in here. Um, and actually, this is kind of, a, for the people who saw this morning's talks, um, I wonder whether people would consider um, these things to be juvenile or not. And I think that's a real discussion point um, as to what is a juvenile component of these eruptions. Um, anyhow, um, the other side of the coin is that the intensely welded material here um, is essentially lava-like. So you cannot tell the difference in hand specimen between the, igno the, the welded ignimbrites and the lavas. The intermediate sort of eutaxitic style of welded deposits are not, are not found. Now, the other point that's going to be interesting today is that lithics are essentially absent in these Um I think I may have found one. Um, so this is a very unusual combination of, of characteristics for a rhyolithic ignimbrite. So just to um, plot that on a, a famous diagram, this is Walker's plot from the 1970s. And as you can see, all the Snake River Plain ignimbrites here are typified by this fine-grained nature, um, well, compared to the typical ignimbrites of, say, Tenerife or somewhere. So the, the, the lacking of lithic clasts has a big effect on the, the grain size parameters because lithics are generally pretty non-vesicular and dense, and then they're pretty heavy. So all these things are based on masses and sieve, sieve fractions, as always. So if you take out the heavier stuff, then you're going to change your grain size um, parameters quite significantly. And there are two arrows to illustrate where these 
these two types of deposits would plot on this diagram. Okay, so the, um, the third point in, in this, this kind of setup part is that the volumes of these ignimbrites are, are considerable. Um, they're on the order of 1,000 to maybe 1,500 cubic kilometers. Um, and at the moment, it may seem like I'm listing random facts, um, but hopefully as, as we get to the uh, conclusion, like all good mysteries, it will be pulled together uh, into one uh, compelling story. So uh, we, we can collate units here along the southern margin of the plain and also um, to the north. Um, this, and Okay, I, I appreciate I haven't got time to do this, and this also is not the crowd for chemistry. Um, but the red and blue units here are, are, are what I just showed on the previous diagram, and this is uh, pretty much everything that we can geochemically uh, measure in those units. So just to give you some sort of faith in what I'm talking about for correlation, um, that's ilmenite compositions, felspars, pyroxenes, trace elements in zircon, radiogenic isotopes. They're also similar in uh, whole rock compositions, stable isotopes, uh, 15 argon argon ages, and uranium lead TIMS data. So I think that's a reasonably compelling data set to say that these eruptions are big. So, uh, what, well, wh why is that significant? Big eruptions happen um, quite frequently. Um, in the case of the Snake River Plain, this is uh, what I've heard referred to as a Caltech plot of, of something against nothing. Um, and here we've just stacked up the, the volumes of the ignimbrites as, as we know them. So, this red line here is what, what I've kind of put in as 50 cubic kilometers of explosive uh, volume. And I may well be proved wrong afterwards, but I'm going to go and say that I don't know of uh, an explosive eruption of 50 cubic kilometers or more, which did not produce a caldera. And someone's bound to have an example. Um, but the point being that if you're making 50 cubic kilometers of deposit, you're generally making a caldera. You're making a caldera, you're fracturing rock and making lithics. So I'm pretty confident with these things are evacuating more than 1,000 cubic kilometers, we're making a caldera. So we're making lithics at source, but we don't find them in the deposits. So immediately that's, that's kind of an issue. So previous, previous work on uh, high-grade ignimbrites. Um, so there's a series of papers by Armand Freund in the uh, mid to late 1990s. And if you don't know these papers, they're, they're, I would really recommend them. They're, they're definitely worth a read. So he was working on the uh, basaltic P1 ignimbrite on uh, Gran Canaria. And his conclusions were that extensive high-grade ignimbrites must be de deposited from dilute low concentration density currents because he felt that classed aggregation in the department, so you've got high temperature par par uh, particles and pyroclasts in the current, so these, these classed are low viscosity. So his feeling was that these things are gonna agglomerate together and form larger, larger clasts and eventually be, I think he used the term, catastrophic deposition. Um, and that plays into the second point here. So if you stick all your particles together in your current efficiently, then you deposit them pretty quickly and uh, the extent of your deposit is gonna be limited. Now, if we think back to the last slide where I showed that, that really um, voluminous ignimbrite, clearly the ignimbrites of the Snake River Plain don't seem to have um, a restricted uh, sort of area. So this made me wonder about how, how this is going to apply to the rhyolitic situation in Idaho. So to start with, we can compare um, the, the grain size data um, from Gran Canaria, from the, the, obviously the non-welded portions of these deposits. Um, and you can see that the, the Gran Canaria deposits here are certainly, um, they certainly have this peak in coarse material. And this is uh, one of the diagrams from the Freund papers indicating what, what he saw in the, um, in the sort of pyroclast record of these eruptions. So um, pretty clearly the, the things in the Snake River Plain do not seem to be doing the same things as the, the basaltic ignimbrite in Gran Canaria. So that, that led me to thinking about, well, where and when does welding occur? And this might be um, somewhat in contrast to um, the, the earlier talk this morning. So to start with, this is a, a paper by Barg et al. in 2008, um, looking at sintering time scales in a, a soda lime glass. So this is a, a, apparently a random uh, temperature of 842 and a variety of grain sizes, but the point being that um, no increase of density, so no sintering was occurring on the time scales of two minutes or more. Now, people who do experiments will tell me that pyroclast-pyroclast interactions are not on the order of two minutes in occurrence. I think most that's not too controversial, hopefully. So if we use the Giordano et al. model to convert this into a, a viscosity of, of this soda lime glass, then this star here represents the viscosity at the, the uh, temperature of their experiments. And so this star represents two minutes um, 
at this viscosity of glass, we need two minutes to stick the particles together, at least. So if we now put on Freund's data, the result's obviously significantly hotter. Um, and you can see here, much lower viscosity. We don't have any information as to time scales here, but okay, I'm, I'm willing to believe that this, this seems to fit well with what he saw in the field. Now, if we put on the Snake River Plain data, and we use the magmatic temperature range as a depositional temperature range, and we use a variety of water contents here, um, you can see that we're orders of magnitude out in terms of viscosity, even at the two-minute time scale of interaction. So it seems like this isn't going to occur in the current in Idaho. And also, I guess, a kind of subsidiary point is that even this blue line at uh, 0.3 weight percent water in, in the rhyolithic glass, I'm not really that keen on. Um, I think any time we, we do things with water in rhyolites on the surface, which are, uh, you know, orders of magnitude out from solubility models are kind of, um, I, I don't particularly like them. Um, but we know that welding goes on um, in, the, in the deposits. We know that welding is syndepositional because we can... Uh, Excellent work by Branny and Andrews has shown that if you look at uh, sheath fold uh, axes and elongation lineations, those change in a, in a semi-systematic way up through the current. Now, what this is interpreted as is reflecting the thal leg of the density current, which is wobbling about over time, as is known as the deposit degrading. Okay? It's very difficult to build this deposit up and then deform it in a, single, in a single way, which will give you a structural pattern like this. So this has to be deformation during the current passing over the degrading deposit. So we have two kind of envelopes for when welding can occur. <clears throat> okay, so um, the kind of final model here. So I, I've, I like the use of uh, inferred here because it means imagined, but it sounds more scientific. So here we have the inferred caldera margin, which we don't get to see anything in the proximal regions. So what, what we think is happening is that as you're aggrading this deposit here, um, this is a low, it's still a pretty um, sticky substrate you've got here. So the material, which is coarser and denser, the bed load, which preferentially spends more time in contact with that material, gets preferentially trapped. So I think there's a preferential trapping effect here in proximal regions. Okay? And this then has implications for when you get more distal. You've already caught all your lithic material close to source, and therefore in the distal regions, which is the only ones that we have any access to, you don't find any lithics. So I, I think this is, this is, I mean, I don't have much evidence of proximal regions, of course, but this seems to make a lot of sense of what we see in the field. So in conclusion, um, we've talked about the unusual um, grain size and lithic characteristics, but I think it's this sticky nature of the, substrate, of the substrate, which is a really important feature, and how that then has a feedback into, um, into what the, the current's doing. So... Um, this might be analogous to um, a leaky, or at least partially leaky boundary um, work by Dufek and others. So pyroclast interactions are, are too short, and essentially, last point is that if somebody is a numerical modeler and is interested, then I would like to talk to them. And I, I don't know if I should say this, but it seems like I'm too young to sort of give the community advice as to what we should be doing, but it feels like... Uh, um, so Ben's, Ben Andrews' poster and Olivier Roche's poster, I think it's really interesting to look at what interactions the deposit is having as the current and what is the feedback between those two things. So I think we really don't have much of a handle on that at the moment. Thank you. We have time for questions. Uh, question was what? I'm, uh, steady. Um, <laughs> the, quest, the question was uh, when I used the term syn depositional welding, what time scales am I invoking there? Um, so, what we can say is that we can show that the current passing over the top of the deposit is having a structural effect on the deposit. So, essentially, the question is how long did the eruption last for? And those things I can't get a handle on. But I can show you that it's not load welding because when you get to these thin sheets of glass, which are three meters thick, those are intensely welded, and they've had no effect of load. So it has to be right then at the time. Can I ask him? Yeah, oh yeah. Yep. 
Okay, so the question was, uh, uh, to paraphrase, it was kind of like maybe the, the lithics are smaller and in thin section that um, you can observe them, more or less. Um, and I would say, well, I've looked at a few thin sections and we don't see them. But to me, the more interesting kind of an an analogy to that is, what are these dense glass chips? I mean, are they juvenile in the sense of are they contributing energy to the eruption or not? And then I think that then plays into sort of some of the earlier talks this morning as to what, what those obsidian chips actually are. I can go. Our next, our next talk will be given by Sarah Ogburn, and this is Dynamic Observations of the 8 January 2010 Pyroclastic Flow from the Soufriere Hills Volcano Montserrat, ascertained by high definition and FLIR video analysis as well as geometric analysis of the DEM. Thank you. Uh, if you're following along in the schedule, you might have noticed that I am not Eliza. Uh, <laughs> uh, so this is some work that is primarily from the, the master's thesis of Alex Mole uh, and some work that I've done as part of my ongoing PhD. Uh, so like you said in the introduction, this is really a combined analysis of both some high definition digital footage and some FLIR uh, thermal video along with some geometric analysis of both um, surge deposits and some of the thermal ascents of some of the ash plumes. So just some rationale. We've had hundreds of small PDCs generated at a variety of different volcanoes, and yet we don't have a lot of direct dynamic information. Um, one notable exception is this Hoblet 1986 paper uh, about some of the smaller eruptions at Mount St. Helens. And we sort of have a key need here to produce PDC models that account for both the, uh, the combined distribution of the, the dense granular undercurrent as well as the dilute ash cloud surge. And we're particularly concerned about um, the surge's propensity to separate or to detach. Obviously, this has often been deadly, most recently, Merapi 2010. So we really need to improve our understanding of this coupling, especially when it comes to the mass and heat fluxes between that dense basal undercurrent and the overriding ash cloud surge. Uh, so I'll be looking at this uh, particular um, PDC, uh, 8th January 2010. There was a volcanic explosion that triggered a dome collapse. So the explosion itself had an 8.3 kilometer plume. Uh, the deposits kind of uh, went into a number of valleys, mostly into this Bellum Valley to the northwest. You can see that flow here in the Bellum Valley. This is taken from the Montserrat Volcano Observatory. And this is a little bit of a strange event. It was mostly dome material, looked like a block and ash flow, but it was about 10 to 20 percent pumice kind of from this explosive phase. Uh, the deposit itself was about 2.7 million cubic meters total, and about 1.3 million cubic meters went into the bellum and reached about 6 kilometers. I want to flip through just some of the images from the HD video here, and I want to point out at this point that this was um, really an opportunistic video. This was not set up in advance. Um, one of the PhD students in my group um, happened to have an HD video set up next to a thermal camera. Uh, a PDC happened to occur, so this is very much a lucky, uh, lucky recording. So here you can see this kind of initial eruption column. You, you can't really make out any PDCs at this point. In this image, you start to see uh, a PDC moving down the flanks of the volcano. You're mostly just seeing the surge cloud here. And you can see that the surge is just kind of fanning out over a wide area. It's not channelized at this point. It's maybe uh, several tens to maybe 100 meters high here. As it comes toward the video cameras, which are at the MVO, it starts to channelize into this Bellum Valley, which is coming through the, the image this way. And you can see that this ash cloud surge has really begun to expand. And you start to get some of this, uh, this lift off of some of the thermal plumes here. We can also start to actually see the flow front itself as it winds through this fairly sinuous valley down around here. It's a bit hard to see the valley itself. Uh, 
but you can make out the flow front in a variety of these images. And it eventually passes by the MVO and uh, sort of disperses in this area. From the thermal video, um, it, it makes it a lot easier to pick out that flow front position. And we can also start to track the buoyant ash plume. So you can see some of these circles um, outlining uh, the same sort of uh, thermal plume here that's been tracked through time. Um, unfortunately, we can only get relative temperatures from this video. Some of the, the raw thermal images weren't recorded, and we really need that for calibration to get absolute temperatures. But the relative temperatures themselves can give us some information as well. And so as part of uh, Alex Mo's thesis, he tracked this flow front advance. He did this using, obviously, the video, this high-resolution DEM that's at about one meter, and a map of the deposit provided by the MBO. And so you're just seeing the, the flow front positions that he could pick out of the videos, along with just the profile of the valley. And he can, he can pinpoint these locations within about 50 meters. From this, you can obviously get flow front velocities. So here again is that plot of the, the flow front positions with the valley profile. This is distance from the dome and velocity. So you can, you can get this average flow front velocity for these discrete segments with errors less than about two meters per second. However, the data don't really capture any um, kind of higher velocity flow front pulsing that we know happens. And I just want to point out uh, with these velocities, you get a big change in behavior somewhere between 3,000 and 4,000 meters from the dome. So you have kind of a linear trend here, and things really drop off dramatically. I'll point out in this area, um, the channel sinuosity increases quite a bit, and the slope decreases. The other thing that we were able to do, like I said, was actually track some of these buoyant thermals. And so this image in the, the yellow kind of hash marks is showing locations where we had good video of the thermals. Uh, the red lines are sort of the lines of sight. So obviously there was a lot of kind of complicated scaling that went into this. We had to scale each uh, plume separately to be able to measure things about them. And like I said, you can, you can kind of pick out uh, in these images these uh, features of the plumes that you can track through subsequent frames in the video. And what he's done, uh, you do have to assume that this plume is primarily ascending vertically, which we know is not quite true, but we're far enough away from the flow at this point. Uh, th that's an okay assumption. And you can track these ascents for about 50 seconds before you lose them. And the error here is about less than 7%. And so these graphs are showing, showing you some information we've extracted from this. Um, here's just the frame interval. Height is along the y-axis in all of these. Uh, you can get ascent velocities and accelerations. And the two different colors are just the, um, the top point on the thermal versus the center. And so you can see that you, you have these increases in velocity with height kind of level off and slow down as they rise further. Um, because a lot of these plumes are at uh, drastically different scales, the sort of easiest way to compare the 13 different uh, thermal plumes was just to plot their maximum ascent velocities. So this is distance with dome and the ascent velocity for each of these plumes that we tracked. Uh, and you can see this relationship with distance from the dome. These, uh, these really high ascent velocities here, they're very close to the dome, and they're probably still related with this sort of explosion plume. Um, the rest of them tend to level off with distance, although I'll point out this group here, which seems to be, uh, have, have greater ascent velocities than, than would be expected from this curve. And again, in this area, this, uh, the flow is encountering pretty complex topography, and I'll show you a little bit more, more about that in just a second. I'll say uh, really briefly that there is ongoing work to actually use some of this data to calculate buoyancies, particle mass fractions, densities, but that's very much ongoing. If you zoom into those flows that seem to ascend at higher velocities than the rest, you can see some of this complex topography. Uh, the valley is really sinuous here. 
The cross-sectional area of the valley is also changing very rapidly. And the thermal footage, while uh, it's just relative temperatures, you, it does indicate that these, uh, these thermal plumes were quite a bit hotter than some of the others that were recorded. And so not only can we look at sort of the, uh, the thermal ascent of these plumes, we can also compare it to the surge detachment itself, so the lateral surge detachment. So one of the parts of this that I worked on was looking at um, basically the detached surge area, so that's just the area of the surge outside of the, the dense basal flow, tracked about every 100 meters, and we could compare that to things like topography, velocity, things like that. And what we found is that there's sort of three surge phases. In the proximal region where you have steep slopes, you have this uh, pretty vigorous expansion from the source region. You have some peak surge detachment that is related to cross-sectional area, which I'll show in just a second. Um, you have this area of surge development, and you have this area of just sort of a passive surge fringe in the distal areas. Like I said, that peak in surge detachment is negatively correlated with cross-sectional area, so there's some, some critical cross-sectional area that's related to the volume of the flow. And we can kind of put this together with the thermal ascent data by looking at it this way. So again, here is the detached surge area. The, the black line is just the valley thawag profile. The dotted line is the valley bank profile. And the gray line is showing you where the surge has actually uh, traversed elevations higher than the valley banks. It's gained elevations. And I've just plotted those, um, those, um, those thermal plumes that ascended with greater velocities than the rest. And so you can see that um, this thermal ascent region, it, it, it is associated with this peak surge detachment but it's also associated where the, the surge gained elevation, which makes, makes sense. I just want to summarize kind of what we're thinking about these surge phases. So uh, in the proximal region, you have this expansion, slopes greater than 10, high flow velocities, steep slopes. You have some of the highest thermal ascent velocities, but these are probably related to the explosive phase. You have really vigorous lateral surge detachment. Um, and we think this is all kind of related to the explosive expansion of pressurized dome rocks, so really things that are taking place in the proximal area. The sort of second region, kind of medial region, we have surge development. The surge reaches that maximum detached surge extent that's related to cross-sectional area of the valley. And you also get those vigorous thermal ascents as the surge encounters the complex topography in this area. And then again, towards the end, in the distal regions, you have this kind of marginal surge fringe. We think it's kind of passive expansion. You have the slowest thermal ascents of the ash plumes, and you also have the lowest flow velocities. So just like a few quick conclusions here. Um, these transitions are reflected in the changes of both the surge deposits and the thermal ascent behavior. Um, and also I'll just point out that in terms of surge dynamics, this isn't kind of a, a a systematic gradual change along the flow, but we get these distinct regimes. So a model based on only a alliteration from the undercurrent would underestimate that large proximal distribution, whereas a model based on the proximal surge current would overestimate the distribution far field. So we can think about using flow velocity maps, kinetic energy from modeling, in terms of ideas about uh, proxies for these surge source areas. We have time for a couple of questions. Let's see, uh, way back. With the what? The, the temp temperature. Right, so we, we really only have these relative temperatures, and as far as we can tell, the, the greatest ascent velocities are related with the hottest plumes. Um, but unfortunately, we don't have a lot of the calibration information that we need to get absolute temperatures, so that's kind of something that we're trying to get around in some of the ongoing work. <laughs> 
Yeah, I, I guess what I was trying to get at is that the flows themselves tended to um, tended to look like block and ash flows in terms of mobility, some other things we measured about them. So while they did contain uh, a percentage of pumice, they seemed to actually behave a lot more like block and ash flows. They were, they were a bit of a hybrid event, I think. Our next talk is also going to be given by Sarah Ogburn, and this is a new look at mobility metrics for pyroclastic density currents, collection, interpretation, and use. So I hope you're not too sick of me at this point. <laughs> um, so switching gears entirely, um, this talk is uh, driven primarily by the development of this uh, PDC database that I've been working on that's kind of come about through my entire PhD. Um, so there's a, a bit about the database itself, and I also wanted to show a quick example of some of the things that you can do with a large database. Um, we have a, a couple uh, statisticians from Duke University that's part of this focused research group on the prediction of extreme events that have helped us with some of the, the statistics in this talk. So it's just a, a brief example of some of the things you can do. Just to introduce this database, it contains about 171 block and ash flows uh, some of which have accompanying ash cloud surge information, 60 pumice flows, and a variety of debris avalanches that are mostly included for comparison. All in all, about 70 volcanoes are represented, and I won't read through this list. There's a whole range of parameters that uh, are included, mostly about the deposits themselves, uh, and they're fairly standard, uh, runout lengths, planimetric areas, volumes, height drops, all the things we generally record about flows. There are a few that I'll point out um, that we have, we're, we're trying uh, for some center of mass estimates. We also have some topographic information. And we do have some, uh, some records of velocity for some of these flows. This talk is very much an invitation uh, for you to join VHUB, which is where this database is located, and to contribute uh, to this process. Um, Part of the motivation is, you know, around about 10 years ago, there was a lot of debate about these mobility metrics and which were appropriate for pyroclastic density currents and should we be using them and all of this kind of thing. And now we tend to just report them as a matter of course and not think too much about it. And so in putting this database together, there's a few things that kind of jump out of you. One is consistency. Um, there's not really any error uh, associated with any of the measurements. Uh, no reported error, that is. Um, there's some things you can do with automation within GIS. Uh, a lot of these metrics that we talk about kind of come out of the debris avalanche community, and so I think there's some uh, need to maybe keep up and move forward, look at some new useful metrics that are coming out of that community. Uh, but really this talk is focused on the fact that there's lots of data out there and we should be using it smartly. So some of the things we do with mobility metrics now is that they, they inform empirical models like Lahar Z, or uh, the energy cone models. Um, but we can also use some of those metrics as physical, mo uh, physical model inputs. So for instance, uh, height dropped over runout is a good estimation of basal friction for Titan. I'll come back to that. I want to show this quick example of some hierarchical Bayesian analysis you can do on some of these large data sets. Uh, but primarily, it's just the, related to this image, which is that posted tabs don't come in enough colors. And so this is my desk when I'm trying to collect some of these parameters and metrics and organize them. And so obviously, we need a database of some of these PDC parameters, metrics, maps. And sort of a last motivation, it is the 80th anniversary of the, the paper that sort of started us talking about mobility metrics in the first place, Heim 1932, so happy. Happy 80th anniversary there. Um, this is supposed to be kind of a mind map of these metrics, and it's sort of intentionally messy to reflect my thought processes, I suppose. But uh, the ones we sort of talk about all the time are H over L or the Heim coefficient. We can talk about that as a friction angle. We also talk about the relationship between area and volume to the two-thirds. 
And I won't talk a lot about some of the, the new metrics coming out of the debris avalanche community, but there's this idea that you can use the aspect ratio of the initial pile um, to, to get at runout. Um, and that really hasn't been applied to PDCs as yet. And so with each of these metrics, there's kind of things that go along with it. We have these issues about volume dependence and center of mass when we talk about H over L. And, and these have their attendant models, I would say. So the energy cone or line model, uh, Titan 2D, Flow 2D are sort of related to this H over L parameter. Lahar Z comes directly out of this relationship. I just have a few plots of the, the span of the data, I would say. So this is H over L versus volume for everything in the database. Um, and this is really just to show you that it's a huge, huge range here. This is 10 orders of magnitude of volume. Uh, you have your PDCs here and various debris avalanches for comparison. And you, of course, can show the same thing with area versus volume. So these are things we always plot and think about. Um, one thing we, d we don't often think about is consistency in the sources of error in these measurements. So what I've tried to plot here is this is volume versus H over L again. And I've put error bars on some of these measurements just based on inconsistencies between data sources. But also you can get at some of the error in length measurements um, by automating some of these measurements within a GIS and comparing it to what was reported in the literature. One thing I'll point out is a lot of uh, data from older sources seems to have the largest error bar. So I think this is when um, a lot of these measurements were being made manually on maps. This can all be automated now. And obviously there's all sorts of sources of error that we might want to think about. Really the, the crux of this talk though is about uh, using mobility metrics for model inputs. So this is something we do on a regular basis. So we all know the energy line or the energy cone model. Uh, one thing that's not sort of widely reported is that you can use this H over L or the friction angle as a good estimate for basal friction angle in models that use a more Coulomb friction, such as Titan 2D. So what I'm trying to show here is that um, in blue, these are mapped flows, their volumes, their friction angles. And if you try to recreate those flows in Titan, the, the basal friction inputs that you need to produce a nice match between the flows tend to be in, in good agreement with the actual uh, H over L values for the flows themselves. So this is a, a good estimate of what sort of model inputs that you might need. And then of course, uh, models like LAHAR-Z, in this case PFZ, uh, uh, is applied to pyroclastic density currents, uses both planimetric and cross-sectional areas relationship with volume um, and, and these uh, coefficients here come directly from a database like this. Um, and so the motivation is that, uh, behind this uh, hierarchical Bayesian modeling is just that these metrics can provide good guidelines for choosing model inputs. However, we have this problem where if we want to do forward modeling of future hazards, we're somewhat limited because we don't have a lot of large volume events in the data set. Uh, there's a scarcity of data at remote or understudied or especially newly active volcanoes. And so this type of modeling has the advantage of allowing volcanoes with very few available observations to sort of borrow information from similar volcanoes. So just to kind of zoom into something about the database, there's 137 dome collapse PDCs from 10 different volcanoes. However, four volcanoes represent 93% of that data. Uh, and so there are lots of volcanoes out there with very sparse data. So I won't go through all the equations. I just want to kind of briefly go through some of the, the, the modeling that our colleagues have done here. So um, instead of simply fitting regression lines through the data for each volcano, you can use this modified hierarchical Bayesian model to sort of assume that dome-forming volcanoes that produce PDCs um, are probably similar to other dome-forming volcanoes that, share, that produce PDCs. And so you can, you can use a common distribution of regression slopes. And it's a, it's a hierarchical model, so it's two stages. First, uh, you fit a linear model separately to the PDCs from each volcano. But in the second stage, you can kind of tie that volcano-level data together by using common distributions of these regression coefficients, so common means, common slope variance, common error variance. Uh, 
And when you do this, you can get these posterior hierarchical regressions. So you, once you, um, the model is well defined, you can apply it to the whole data set, um, redefine the parameters, and uh, it, these, are, these are a little hard to see, but the, the colors are just the different volcanoes, so in green, uh, the green points and the green lines are showing the posterior regressions for uh, Montserrat, and then the red is Merapi, black Kalima, blue is Unzen. And what you'll notice is that the slopes are all very similar, the intercepts are allowed to vary, um, and the confidence bounds um, are all sort of centered around the same points in the data. And what this really allows you to do is that um, uh, volcanoes that have few observations can sort of borrow information for, from uh, uh, similar volcanoes that have more information, and you can use this to improve model predict predictions. So instead of kind of sampling randomly, this is, um, these are some replicates running through the model just for Montserrat, so this is volume versus friction here, and you can sort of sample this whole space and take into account some of the uncertainty um, here. I want to finish just talking a little bit about the database itself because this is really where I'm uh, asking for input. So uh, I think the first thing is which parameters to include. There are obviously many that could be included. They're color coded here by what we have and what we don't. Obviously we have a lot of information about run out length, height dropped, planimetric area. We have some volumes, maps, topographic information. Sometimes we have some cross-sectional areas or velocities. And very rarely do we have any estimates of center of mass or thickness or pile dimensions, which is what you would need to do some of these pile aspect ratio uh, calculations. We might include ash cloud surge parameters. You could even include model produced parameters. So we were talking earlier about how kinetic energy from models might uh, be, be a relevant thing to look at. And then there's the whole issues of maps and shape files and whatnot. Um, I'll just really quickly talk about this uh, center of mass estimates, though, because with a GIS, there's a, a lot of ways that you can actually estimate center of mass. You can do really simple things like take the midpoint of a deposit, take the centroid of a deposit shape. Obviously, that assumes a, a uniform thickness, which is not very useful. You can, um, you can do these linear dec decreasing thickness models to try to get at it. Um, you, you can even take outputs for models that output flow depth and, and get the, the modeled center of mass. So this plot is just showing you what you get from all of that. I won't really go into detail, but the, the real issue is that these models are well and good, but we really need these well-mapped flows for comparison. So I guess uh, one of the first things on my wish list is that if anybody has um, a lot of flow thickness data that we might try and compare to some of these estimates, that would be a great thing. Uh, and finally, this database is really a work in progress. Right now, it's a, a fairly sprawling Excel sheet that is sort of slowly working its way into a relational database. Uh, but this obviously needs help from the community to expand, both to correct my inevitable errors and also to add to it. Um, and I've put the URL for VHub up here. The database is hosted on VHub. VHub is free to join. Um, right now, the group itself is by request, but if you send me an email, I will certainly add you, and you can take a look at the data. So there's the URL again, and thank you. We have time for a question. Certainly. One of the things that I didn't mention in the previous flow, I showed some of that, uh, the relationship between the detached surge and the topography. 
That's actually part of a much larger work where we've done that with every flow on Montserrat. And so for Montserrat, at least, we actually do have a lot of information about the interaction with the flows with topography. Um, but obviously, that's Montserrat. It's kind of easy there. So uh, certainly, I think that's, that's important. Thank you. I'd like to welcome our next speaker to the stage. This talk will be given by Joe Estep. And the title is Experimental Observations and Discrete Element Simulations of Bed Force Anomalies Due to Force Chains in Dense Granular Flows. Uh, thanks for having me. My name's Joe, and uh, today I'm going to be talking to you about some work I've been doing with uh, Joe Dufek at Georgia Tech. And um, basically, I'll just be uh, talking about some experiments and some numerical modeling that we've been doing, uh, looking at force chains and uh, dense granular flows. And to motivate this talk a little bit, I just want to show you a couple images to where we would expect some of these processes to occur, and just state the fact that dense volcanic flows are fundamentally linked to granular flows. And uh, for instance, we see a pyroclastic density current here in Mount St. Helens. We see a, a, a flow deposit from uh, Tungarawa and also a, a deposit from a flank collapse at Montserrat. And I'd, I'd like to point out that you look at a, an image of a pyroclastic density current such as this, and what you see is a high volume dilute portion of the flow when actually at the base of this is where most of the mass and the energy resides. So some of the broad research questions that we started with when we began this uh, research was, First of all, are force chains prominent in free surface dynamic flows? And uh, what prompted this question is the, the fact that uh, force chains have been well documented and confined or are very slowly shearing systems. And we wanted to try to, uh, to, to look at this for, for dynamic systems. Um, and assuming that they are present, uh, we would ask the question is uh, how do uh, a range of particle sizes influence the force chain development in these, um, these systems? And finally, uh, what are the characteristic timescales associated with these types of processes, and are there any limitations due to those timescales, ultimately to get to the, the question of how do all these different things influence the propagation of these flows? So now the big question so far probably is what are force chains? And basically these are uh, these filamentary structures that occur in granular materials where a small fraction of the total number of particles um, accommodate the majority of the body forces or, or uh, externally applied forces in a system. This schematic here shows um, a granular flow moving down an incline and the shading here, the dark shading indicates uh, pr primary uh, force chain members, the smaller shade or lighter shades indicate secondary members and the unshaded particles would be what we call spectator particles. A good way to conceptualize this maybe would be consider a pile of apples on a table and uh, if you were to remove an apple from the bottom of that pile and the pile collapses, you removed uh, an apple that was a primary member of the force chain. Um, and if you remove an apple, nothing happens. It was a, spec a spectator. Um, obviously, that would be for a, a static system. And, and what we're really interested in is these dynamic free surface systems. So here's an image from one of our experiments, uh, photoelastic experiments. I'll expand on this a little bit later. But basically, the principle here is that for transparent materials that have cross-polarized light passing through them, uh, when they're stressed or when there's a force applied to their boundaries, they, they become birefringent. And the intensity of this birefringence is proportional to that force that you apply. And so what you can clearly see here in this, uh, this more vertical uh, liniment here is, is a primary force chain. And then we see here what we consider a secondary member force chain. And then everything else basically would be considered spectator particles. And um, sort of the implication here is that these force chains transmit high magnitude localized, localized forces to the substrate. And, um, and, and further that the, uh, the flow momentum can be altered by entrainment and that the entrainment mechanism may be enhanced by force chain activity. And as I was alluding to earlier, with these photoelastic experiments, it, again, it's based on the principle, this principle of the intensity of the birefringence being proportional to the, the, the forces, it allows us to quantify the forces at the bed. And what we did is we uh, developed a simple apparatus to, to, to look at the, the bed physics um, in these granular uh, flows. And for our first set of experiments, uh, we, we observed that the bed force excursions due to force chains were on the order of 40 times higher than the values that we would calculate uh, from the flow height. And this was for monodispersed systems. Now, I, I want to um, just note here that when I, I talk about uh, a value calculated from the flow height or an expected uh, bed force, I'm referring to 
uh, bed forces that are uh, generated in sort of a continuum sense and just to use that as a baseline comparison to the values that we measure in, uh, from, from the force chain activity. So here's a little schematic of the experimental apparatus and basically you have uh, the two-dimensional uh, ramp configuration here between two glass plates, cross-polarizing filters to uh, 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 polarize the uh, light source behind the apparatus and all this is going to be captured on a high-speed camera. And here is a video of one of our flows. You can see the force change that light up sort of like lightning. And if we focus our attention just at one spot on the ramp and we record the force that is uh, applied to the particle contacting the ramp at the location, then we can generate a time series of bed force throughout the duration of the flow. I'd also like to note that the, the real time duration of this flow is about a second and a half, so it's, it's slowed down tremendously right here. And this is the uh, time series that we would get. This is, uh, again, from the monodisperse experiments uh, we originally conducted. And um, the, the different color here is, uh, indicate the different ramp inclinations. And so the green would be a 30 degree ramp, the blue would be a 20 degree ramp, and the red would be a 10 degree ramp. You can see the baseline here. This is the uh, forces that you would expect from the height of the flow. The jump here is because we start uh, uh, accumulating a deposit structure and having a, a static jam state. And you can clearly see that there's a lot of these uh, spikes due to the force chain activity, and more generally that uh, the tendency higher spikes for a higher inclination on the ramp. And uh, here I just wanted to show a few uh, sample images from some of the experiments and um, just to kind of illustrate uh, what some of the things that we see and some of the challenges that are, are presented by the, these complex uh, sort of structures. And uh, you can see that some of these are very long, uh, some of them are very convoluted and, and have a lot of uh, arching and, and branching and things of that nature. Some of them are parallel to the, uh, to the, to the base of the flow. And furthermore, we have uh, several images where there are no force chains present at all. And this just indicates that it's a discontinuous process. It doesn't mean they're not important, obviously, but but th that they're not always there. And so uh, the next step in our research was to uh, try to implement this sort of thing into a numerical model. We utilize, utilize MFIX, which is a, a product of the National Energy Laboratory. And the discrete element approach basically tracks everything in the domain independently. And it's pretty simple. It just solves for Newton's second law. Um, so using the discrete element approach, we ran a little over 200 simulations using the same three ramp inclines and 10 values of contact stiffness. Um, Contact stiffness basically is just a measure of how difficult it is to deform a material, and it turns out that the results of our model are, are most uh, sensitive to this parameter, which I'll expand upon later. Oh, can I go back? Okay, sorry. Okay, this is an animation of one of our uh, simulations. The same principle as the experiments, pretty much the same setup. Drop particles in release a gate, they flow down the incline. You can see the color, uh, color bar here that indicates the force on the particles, and you can see that just as in the experiments, they're lighting up and forming these force chain structures. And we're going to use the same principle as looking at just one spot and recording, one spot on the ramp and recording the forces on the uh, bed contacting particle to generate a time series. And that's what we see here. The bottom plot actually is what corresponds to the values consistent with what we used in the experiments for the soft plastic photoelastic disks. And you can see that the time series um, looks very similar in form. The red lines in all of these are going to be the expected uh, bed force due to the flow height. The difference in uh, these um, y-axis here is that they're normalized by the, the, uh, the force of a single particle. And uh, for the sand and rock plots shown at the top, you can see that we use different values for mass, diameter, and contact stiffness. And um, you have a, a tremendous excursion from uh, the values that you see for the experimental value, uh, the experimental um, materials. But again, the form is the same. You see a lot of spikes. You see a lot of force chain activity. The green and the blue here are different positions. It's so sort of just as a way of a sanity check. Instead of just using one position, uh, we recorded these, uh, these um, bed forces at two different locations for, e for each run. And this is sort of a busy plot, but it's got some good information. And I'm plotting uh, bed force relative to the contact stiffness parameter. The horizontal lines correspond to the peak forces from the experiments and the vertical lines correspond to the contact stiffness calculated from the experiments. And the way we calculated that is by measuring the deformation on the actual particles uh, that were members of force chains. And the overlap between these creates this yellow shaded box. I call this the validation box. And because that, that's the reason I call it that is because the data that falls within this range successfully reproduces the data from the experiments. You can see the model does a really good job here. 
Another thing to point out is that as this contact stiffness parameter increases, we see a, a, a corresponding increase in bed forces, and also as we uh, observed in the experimental data, a higher inclination also corresponds to a higher uh, peak bed force due to the force chain activity. So the next step was to sort of introduce some complexity into the, the disk populations. And what we wanted to do is, in addition to the monodispersed systems that I've already been discussing, look at some uh, different size ratios. So this would be small to large uh, disk ratios of, of 1 to 1, 2 to 1, and 4 to 1. And this was, a, this was just some experiments. And we generated the same sorts of time series that you've uh, seen before already. And um, so here is the monodispersed system, which would be pretty much the same thing as before. The, the ramp inclination here, I think, was 31 degrees. And uh, the other plots will be the 1 to 1, 2 to 1, and 4 to 1 ratios. You can see that the form of the information is, is still the same. Uh, the, expected, uh, the expected bed forces are, are the horizontal dotted lines, and we see very strong excursions. The, the tremendous uh, difference that you would see is that uh, there's a, a much higher frequency of these peaks for the... Uh, the um, mixed populations and for the monodispersed system. And here the y-axis is, uh, is normalized by the expected flow height rather than the um, force of a single particle. So just to uh, brush upon these characteristics, these time scales real quickly, I'm going to focus on the last two here, this mesoscopic or force propagation time scale, which is modeled as a Rayleigh wave speed. The macroscopic or contact time scale is just the inverse of the shear rate. And what we want to do is compare these two and see if the contact time limits force propagation uh, for this force chain processes. And if we assume a force chain with 10 particles, use the uh, properties of the uh, photoelastic disks, the soft plastic, and we see that the Rayleigh wave speed is two orders of magnitude shorter than the contact time. And what that means is that contact time does not limit force propagations in these sorts of systems. Now, if we apply this same uh, approach to a sand grain system, for instance, using the material properties of sand, again, assuming a, a force chain with 10 particles, then we see that the contact time is, uh, again, three orders of magnitude uh, larger than the force propagation time scale, which tells us that we would expect to see force chain processes in uh, systems that, uh, use nat that um, consist of natural materials. And so um, basically, just to summarize what we've done, we've quantified some best force excursions due, uh, due to force change using photoelastic experiments and started to look at some bi-dispersed po disk populations. We've used that uh, data to validate a discrete element model, applied that model to the um, to using uh, ma material properties of, of natural materials, and, and this leads us to some uh, more open questions. And one thing I didn't really get into is that we, we actually observed force propagation into the substrate ahead of the flow front for some of our experiments, which is very interesting. And, and for instance, in the case of a, um, a saturated, uh, saturated substrate, this could have implications for pore pressures. And then some other questions will be how do topography influence these networks, and how does uh, three-dimensional um, domains or how does the two-dimensional the two information that we've obtained so far translate into a, a three-dimensional domain? And with that, I'd like to ask for any questions. Sure, and um, I haven't really looked in that too much. We did decompose a lot of the, um, the, the normal and shear components of, of a lot of the force chains that we observed in the experiments, and it, it seemed that they were on the same order of magnitude relevant of the particular angle. Um, but that is a really good question, and it, it would take some more um, investigation to really get a good answer to that. Uh, the questions uh, about a characteristic frequency um, associated with the peaks, we, uh, we, we, we don't. We've looked and there really, nothing has showed up. Uh, the um, spectrograms have been really noisy. The, the difficulty here is that um, these are really, really short duration uh, flows, especially with the numerical models, and so we would want to have a, a, a longer do time domain to be able to try to identify such sort of uh, periodicities. Thanks. Steve. Yeah. Oh, sorry. That's a good question, and uh, that's one of the reasons why we're trying to look at uh, sort of these different uh, diverse populations. And um, 
I sort of expected to see maybe a slight reduction in the, the peak values just by introducing the bi-dispersed systems, and, and that didn't happen. So um, it's really an open question, and anything I say would be speculation, but <laughs> I don't know. This is a good question. I'd like to welcome Olivier Roche up here, and he'll be speaking on entrainment of granular substrate by pyroclastic flows, an experimental study and its implication for flow dynamics. And this is an invited presentation. Thank you, Ben, and uh, thanks very much for the invitation. Uh, oh, sorry. Here? Okay. So the aim of uh, this study is to investigate the interaction between pyroclastic flows and granular substrates on which uh, they can propagate. So the objective here is to investigate the mechanisms of uh, possible entrainment of the substrate by the flows and then to discuss uh, the, some possible implications for the flow dynamics. So these issues were investigated here through laboratory experiments on dense and fluidized granular flows propagating on a, uh, a cohesionless granular substrate. So there are several field examples of uh, substrate entrainment by uh, pyroclastic flows. Uh, this occurs at, uh, at Mount St. Helens uh, for, for the flows that occurred on May 18, 1980. Uh, and these uh, pyroclastic flows propagating on the debris uh, avalanche deposit that formed just before them. These are pictures of outcrops at a distance of several kilometers from the vent and showing th that the pyroclastic flow deposit contains large blocks of andesites uh, mixed with the fine ash uh, matrix. And uh, these blocks are clearly derived from the debris avalanche deposit that is present at a distance less than 100 meters upstream. This is based on field observations by Brand and Pollock. And the blocks are present either at the contact with the underlying units or at upper levels, a few meters above the contact. And for further details, please uh, listen to a talk by Nick Pollock this, this afternoon at uh, 4 o'clock. Uh, this is another example. This is the pitch spring turf in Arizona. The picture is from uh, Greg Valentine. The deposit here contains large basalt lithics derived from uh, fluvial sediments. So inter interestingly here, the deposit was able to entrain these dense blocks from places located upstream, but it was unable to rework a finely grained surge or fall deposit that is absolutely intact. This is another picture of the pitch spring turf showing large lithics of basalt and granite that are not derived from the vent and that are present at uh, different levels in the deposit. So uh, the issue of pyroclastic flow propagation on a granular substrate was uh, investigated, investigating here through dam break uh, by doing experiments on dam break granular flows. In this configuration, the front velocity U is Proportional, it depends on H, the height of the initial column that is released by means of a sliding gate. We use fine glass beads for the, for the flows of uh, a diameter of 80 microns for scaling considerations that I'm not going to discuss uh, today. We did experiments on initially fluidized flows by injecting a flux of air vertically at the base of the granular column. And for comparison, we also did experiments on uh, non uh, fluidized granular flows. In both cases, the flow structure consists of a sliding head and of an aggrading basal deposit uh, behind. We did measurement of the basal of the pore pressure, pore feed pressure at the base of a sliding head, and we investigated the propagation of these flows on a flat and horizontal substrate represented in blue here. So this is a, a video showing the emplacement of an initially fluidized flow on a smooth substrate of uh, glass beads of 80 microns. These, are, uh, these beads are the same as the beads uh, forming uh, the flow. Note that the movie speed is 40 times less than uh, the actual speed. In that case, oops. Oh. No. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah it's okay. In that case, uh, shear at the base of the sliding head generates small shear structures of height of only uh, one millimeter. And these structures strongly elongate with time so that there is almost no evidence of entrainment in uh, the final deposit. Now, in contrast, this is a video showing uh, the propagation of a flow on a rough substrate here consisting of steel beads of a diameter of 1.6 millimeter. Oh, sorry. 
Okay? And in that case, untrainment clearly occurs at the base of the sliding head. And uh, now let's see what happened in details in, uh, in a similar experiment. This is a, clo a close view showing that the frontal part of the flow slides over the substrate and then at a distance of about one to three centimeters from the front, many of the uppermost particles of the substrate are dragged horizontally while fine particles of the flow uh, percolate downwards. But there is also evidence that many of the dense steel beads are uplifted well above the top, the top of, the, uh, of the substrate. And that configuration, the final deposit at the base, consists of a mixture of the coarse particles derived from the substrate and of fine particles of, of the flow. Okay, so the process, these processes were also, obse were also observed in case of uh, with non free ice flows. So in both cases, in summary, what we have for, smooth, for propagation on smooth substrate we observe small shear structures that elongate with time, and we have almost no evidence of entrainment in the final deposit. But in contrast, in case of a rust substrate, basal shear causes drag of the uppermost particles, and we have evidence, clear evidence of uplift of some of the particles. And I'm now going to discuss a possible mechanism to explain this uh, uplift. So we did measurement of the pore pressure at the base of the sliding head of the flow. This is a graph showing the pressure as a function of time. Zero pressure corresponds to the atmospheric pressure. The sliding head of the flow generates first a relative under pressure of maximum amount delta P. In case the flow is initially free of course, the body of the flow generates a positive pressure. So the, this graph shows the, the under pressure delta P as a function of the flow front velocity for both non-free dice flows and initially free dice flows. And in that case, the flows were either non-expanded or were ex slightly expanded at an amount of uh, only 5%. And these data show that this under pressure has the dimension of a dynamic pressure as it is proportional to the square of the front velocity. It also depends on the bulk density of the flow and we can determine an, an empirical constant alpha. So for, at a, for a given velocity u, the under pressure generated by the free dice flow free dice flows is about twice that generated by the non-free dice flows, which could be due to the different physics of uh, both types of flows. So next, let's now consider the possible influence of the under pressure generated at the, uh, at the interface between the flow and the substrate uh, below. This is a very simple basic uh, analysis. Let's assume that the under pressure is maintained in the granular substrate, and in that case, an upward pressure gradient may arise. And the force associated to this pressure gradient uh, is able to uh, uplift a particle if this force counterbalances the weight of the particle. So we can determine a critical pressure gradient, taking into account the effective area over which the upward force is applied. And for spherical particles, we obtain this uh, equation. Uh, taking into account the, fr the particle diameter and the density. Now, taking into account the empirical law we have obtained, and that relates the under pressure to the flow velocity, we obtain the critical flow velocity that can cause uplift of the particle, depending on uh, the, these parameters here. So this uh, prediction was tested, tested against experiments. Uh, this graph shows the maximum height of uplift of the particles from the substrate as a function of the, the pressure gradient generated by the flow head. We did first experiments with a substrate of coarse steel beads having a diameter of 1.5 millimeters, and we did experiments with non free dice flows and free dice flows. This is the critical theoretical pressure gradient for uplift of the particles, and we note that the height of uplift, up, uplift increases with uh, the delta P, the, the pressure gradient. These are the data for a substrate of dense steel beads having a diameter about equal to that of the, of the glass beads. And in that case, we observe that there is almost no uplift below the critical pressure gradient as particles are dragged horizontally. But onset of uplift occurs approximately at the critical pressure gradient. This is a, these are the same data, but with a linear scale for the, uh, the pressure gradient showing that uplift the height of uplift, uplift increases rapidly just above the critical pressure gradient, but then it increases at a much slower rate. So in summary, these uh, results show that 
Onset of uplift occurs approximately at the critical pressure gradient we have determined. But this onset does not depend on the particle diameter because here uplift of particles having about the same diameter occurs at clearly different critical pressure gradient. Second, the height of uplift, uplift does not depend on the flow velocity. For a given substrate, the same height of uplift at a given delta p is observed for both the non freedized and the freedized flows that have very much different uh, flow velocities. So now let's come back to the field and consider the polyclastic flows at Mount St. Helens. Uh, we consider two outcrops here at uh, these distances from the vent where the local slope is very small. And we assume that blocks from the debris avalanche deposits were uplifted and entrained. And the uh, field measurement shows that these blocks, uh, uh, we assume that they have a simple parallel shape of a parallelepiped. And these blocks are undesired. And the mean value of the shortest axis of this block is 25 to 35 centimeters. Now, assuming uh, for calculations, we assume a bulk flow density uh, of 1,400 kg per, uh, per cubic meter, and we assume a minimum value corresponding to an expansion of 60% as suggested by uh, over laboratory experiments. Now, taking into account the critical value for uplift of the particles, we obtain values, flow velocities of about 10 meters per second, which is in good agreement with uh, flow velocities reported by Oblitz for flows that occurred three months later at, uh, and at the same distances from the vent. And the agreement is particularly good for the, the dense flows. So in conclusions, there are field observations showing that uh, finely grained substrate may not be reworked by proclastic flows. And in contrast, there are evidence that large blocks can be uplifted for coarse grained sediments. This is a rather counterintuitive. Laboratory experiments experiments match well with these observations and in particularly and particularly shows that large particles are uplifted at the flow head through the combined effect of basal shear and an associated upward pressure gradient. In turn, the results suggest that this pressure gradient is efficient only if the substrate is sufficiently rough. And we obtain an empirical law for critical uplift of uh, uh, for the critical velocity at which uplift uh, can occur. So, as a very final conclusion, this study suggests that here we may have a method to invert polyclastic flow deposits. Applications to flows at Mount St. Helens suggest velocities of about 10 meters per second in, um, in agreement with uh, field observations. Thanks very much. We have time for a couple of questions. In the experiments, the porosity is the same. I mean, if you consider a smooth or a rough substrate, the porosity in both cases is about 40%. You see what I mean? The porosity is the same. So what really changes is the relative roughness that clearly depends on the size of the particles. But the porosity is the same. Uh, you mean when the fine particles percolate on one? I think this is a simple consequence due to the, the, to the, the size of the spaces, of the interstices between the, the particles. I don't think this plays any uh, dynamical effect. I mean, this is a, from the videos, it seems to me that this is a simple consequence of the size of the interstices. And as particles are slowed down during uh, motion. But I'm not 100% sure. I'd like to welcome our final talk for the morning up here, and this, this will be Brittany Brand and others speaking on pyroclastic density current hazards in the Auckland Volcanic Field, New Zealand. Okay, uh, thank you for sticking around. Okay, so Auckland is the largest and fastest growing city in New Zealand. It is situated on an active volcanic field, an active basaltic volcanic field, which has been active over the last 250,000 years. The youngest eruption is uh, the eruption of Rangitoto here, uh, which occurred about 600 years ago. Of the 49 volcanic centers in this field, 
More than 75% of them have begun with a free atomagmatic, a violent free atomagmatic phase. Uh, because of the abundance of external water in the volcanic field, it's very likely that a future eruption in the Auckland volcanic field will also begin with a free atomagmatic eruption. By far the most dangerous and deadly hazard associated with free atomagmatic eruptions are dilute pyroclastic density currents, which are often called base surges when they're associated with free atomagmatic eruptions. They're essentially column collapse driven uh, dilute flows that radiate out from the base of an explosion column, which Amanda Clark talked about earlier this morning uh, or earlier in this session. And of course, the challenge that we face is trying to understand the dynamics and the damage potential of these types of currents uh, from field evidence. So this study location is uh, the Mongataki Taki Tuffering, which is a fun word. Uh, it's located down here in the south part of the volcanic field. Um, and because of the dense population in the volcanic field, very few of these um, volcanic centers are well exposed. Uh, but this volcanic center um, has very good exposures along the coast here. Uh, it's a tough ring. Um, this, this is a digital elevation model. This, this feature up here is probably part of an older edifice. Um, but the, the tough ring that we're dealing with has a tough ring rim here. Um, the eruption began with a violent free atomagmatic phase that produced base surge deposits. Uh, base surges and base surge deposits, which are well exposed down here and around the, around the tough ring. Um, the eruption finished with a magmatic phase, which produced a scoria cone in the center here, which is actively being quarried, which is why it looks kind of strange in the DEM. What's interesting and unique about this particular eruption is that the early base surges knocked down a young forest of podocarp trees up to about this location from source. Um, so the goal of this study is to use the distribution and the types of these trees to constrain dynamic pressures, similar to uh, an earlier talk in the session, um, and then apply a quantitative numerical model to try to understand the dynamics of these currents and the damage potential in the Auckland volcanic field and elsewhere for similar types of eruptions. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is be able to constrain the initial vent location. Um, clearly, the end of the eruption, the vent location was around this area, but uh, in MAR eruptions such as this, vent location can migrate, um, as, and this is kind of an elongated feature. So we have some evidence that suggests the initial vent location might have been up in this area. Um, some of our strongest evidence um, are in the bed forms from the dilute uh, base surges. Uh, at this location A, the bed forms exposed in the uh, platform here have wavelengths of about 10 to 15 meters. Whereas point B, which is about equidistant from the center of the crater, have bed forms about one meter. Um, there's also a much higher percent of ballistic uh, blocks in this area relative to down here. So we assume that our initial vent location was about in this location. So based on this, um, we have a total runout distance of the early base surges of about 1.8 kilometers. And the trees were knocked down to about 0.9 kilometers from source and left standing beyond this and then just buried in the flow, similar to what John Major showed at the Chaitan eruption. Um, and he also noticed how the deposits were kind of plastering or building up on the upstream side of the trees. And you can also see the same thing here where you have the tree is decomposed because uh, the eruption was about 200,000 years ago. Uh, but the beds actually deform and uh, wrap around the uh, trees. Okay, so in terms of trying to understand the damage potential of pyroclastic currents, we need to constrain the dynamic pressure. The dynamic pressure is a uh, function of the bulk density or the concentration of the current and the velocity. Um, this is just kind of a visual schematic that I've put together based on the work of Valentine 1998, which illustrates the damage potential of, uh, of pyroclastic currents or of different dynamic pressures. So here we've got dynamic pressure on the horizontal axis and structural damage, relative structural damage on the vertical axis. And just to point out that you can get near, well, very severe to near total destruction of most man-made structures at about 35 kilopascals. And dilute PDCs can exceed 100 kilopascals proximal to source. So it's gonna be important to constrain how quickly the dynamic pressure in these types of currents decreases um, as the particles are sedimenting and the velocity is decreasing. I also want to, of course, mention that there is still risk to human life, even in the distal uh, ends of these currents when the dynamic pressure has dropped below structural damage as uh, illustrated in the eruptions of Mount Pele and Vesuvius. Okay, so we use the tree, um, the tree distribution to estimate the dynamic pressures. 
So we know that the trees are podocarp trees, um, and we have constrained the, we measured the radius and constrained the height of the tree. So this is uh, calculating the dynamic pressure necessary to knock down the trees of this composition. Um, this is the equation here where I is the moment of inertia for a given radius of the tree. This is the yield strength, which uh, for this type of tree is 62 megapascals. And uh, we have a coefficient of drag, which is assumed to be 1.1, which is an approximation for dilute uh, currents. So given this, we have uh, dynamic pressures in the range of 12 to 35 kilopascals. So the next step here is to um, compare these field results with numerical models. Um, so Amanda presented this model earlier. I'll go through it pretty quickly. Um, but this is a quantitative numerical model for a radially spreading current. We assume depth average properties um, and steady state model. And the usefulness of using numerical models is that we can explore the effects of things like ambient entrainment, particle sedimentation, basal friction, and changes in current thickness and, and density as the current propagates away from source. And these are the types of things that you can't really get a direct um, idea of from looking at the deposits alone. So in order for our model to make sense, um, or model success, uh, we need to produce dynamic pressures of above 12 kilopascals, about 0.9 kilometers from source, which drop below that point afterwards to knock down the trees but leave them standing beyond this point, uh, and run out distances of 1.8 kilometers. So model, uh, Amanda went through the model earlier, but just quickly, um, we solved for the conservation of mass, momentum, and energy, where we have mass flux on the left side of the equation, which is a function of the bulk density, uh, velocity, and flow thickness. Um, the mass added due to entrainment, where am, uh, alpha is the uh, ambient density and epsilon is the entrainment coefficient. The entrainment coefficient is a function of the Richardson number. So basically, the lower the Richardson number, the more supercritical the current becomes and the higher the entrainment rate. And then, of course, we have the mass loss due to sedimentation, which is a, part, a function of the particle settling velocity. Uh, this is a conservation of momentum, where you have the momentum flux. And this takes into account uh, flow thickening, or, or deceleration of the flow due to the flow thickening, um, and acceleration due to flow down the slope, um, and acceleration due to decreases in, in the bulk density, any kind of frictional drag, and momentum loss due to sedimentation. And then, of course, the conservation of energy, um, which basically takes into account cooling via entrainment, where here we take into account the specific heat of the atmosphere of the pyroclasts and the bulk, bulk specific heat of the flow, and energy loss due to sedimentation. Um, all right, so we're trying to create a best fit to the field data. And um, we know that this was a basaltic eruption, so we can put in our initial conditions uh, reasonable for basalt. And these are the types of parameters that we can vary that we think have an effect on things like runoff distance and dynamic pressures, okay? Um, these are the initial thickness of the current, velocity, bulk density, uh, and so on. Um, so we have some constraints here. We know that the average grain size for the Mangataki-Taki case is about 0.5 centimeters. Uh, there's essentially negligible slope, very low slopes, and we assume a high friction coefficient due to obvious interaction with, uh, with trees in a forest. Uh, and given this, we produce uh, the, the best fit to the field data for our numerical models, uh, have initial thicknesses of 70 meters, initial velocity is of 60 meters per second, and bulk density is around 35 kilograms per meters cube, which is reasonable um, based on a literature review and what we expect for these types of currents. So here I'm plotting some of the results where this is the radial distance, uh, this is surge density, velocity, current thickness, and dynamic pressure. And just note that the current runs out, or the, the runout distance is, uh, occurs when the bulk density of the current is equal to the density of the atmosphere. Um, and we here, we're reproducing dynamic pressures of 12 kilopascals at about 0.9 kilometers from source. Um, and just to note here that the bulk density decreases fairly rapidly um, with distance from source due to the particles settling. You have an initial acceleration in the current, which is consistent with uh, thinning due to radial spreading at the initial phase of the current, and then deceleration due to the flow thickening due to entrainment. The dynamic pressure drops off fairly quickly, uh, both as a function of the decreasing velocity and surge density. Okay, 
Um, so this is showing that even though we have some simplifications in the model, we are able to reproduce the, the, um, the field observations. And of course, the power of using numerical models is that once we semi-validate it you know, with a field comparison, then we can kind of take a step back and start varying individual parameters one at a time to really try to understand which is having a first order control on the dynamics of the current. Um, here we know that the runout distance is primarily a function of the sedimentation of the particles um, and the entrainment of ambient air, which is a function of the bulk density, initial thickness, and the velocity of the current, among other things. So for example, uh, first we can um, vary the initial bulk density, and we see that, as we might expect, with higher initial bulk densities uh, results in longer runout distance and higher dynamic pressures with distance from source. Varying initial height um, also produces uh, longer runout distances and higher dynamic pressures due to a lower settling velocity uh, and a more pronounced thinning as um, or a more pronounced acceleration due to the uh, radial thinning. Um, one question that we have here, though, of course, is how do we constrain this initial thickness of the flows? When we look at the case of, for example, um, the, the Kurimsky eruption, um, those currents might have been a couple hundred meters thick, uh, but so this is something that we kind of need to understand a little bit better as well. Um, now this is kind of a little bit counterintuitive, but very interesting. Uh, so when we vary initial velocity, so here's the results, where we have an initial velocity of 30, 60, and 90 meters per second. And we see that with higher initial velocities, we actually uh, result in shorter runout distances. And this is a function of that entrainment coefficient. So with higher initial velocities, you're uh, pushing your current into more supercritical regime and increasing the rate of entrainment, which is going to, which is going to uh, stop the flow more, more quickly. And we see the same relationship for increasing slope. Um, so this uh, also motivates the, the need to really understand the mechanism of entrainment as well. OK, so for the case of the Auckland volcanic fields, um, we uh, are going to apply the model in terms of assessing damage potential for an average case eruption of a runout about two to four kilometers and a worst case scenario of a runout distance of up to seven kilometers. The plots here, um, this is the one for the average case between two to four, the worst case up to seven. And essentially here, um, you could expect severe damage up to at least two, kilo, two kilometers from source for the average case scenario, and five kilometers, um, up to five kilometers from source for the worst case scenario. And so this is just kind of to illustrate how a numerical tool like this can be used to assess hazard potential um, in, in volcanic fields, such as the Auckland Volcanic Field. So essentially to summarize, um, even though simplifications were made uh, in our model, we're still able to capture the field characteristics and reproduce things like our estimates of dynamic pressure and runout distance. Um, but really the main point here is that by applying these numerical models, we can really start to understand the first order controls on the current dynamics, uh, the runout distance, and the damage potential of these flows. So future work is going to um, introduce a density stratification currently the models are depth averaged and uh, a range of grain sizes. And as Amanda talked about earlier, also trying to understand the internal gravity waves that are generated within these currents and how they control bed form formation and migration. Thank you. We have time for a couple questions. Lunch time. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. Thank you. I'd like to thank everyone, and I'd like to thank all of our speakers one last time. And before everyone runs off to lunch, I want to remind everyone that there are still two more pyroclastic sessions this afternoon, and I think those are in room 102, I believe. And yes, good, I got that right. So come back. There's lots more great talks, and have a good lunch. <laughs>